another episode of Search News You Can Use with me, Dr. Marie Haynes. Well, we did it, 2022. It feels like it was just a few days ago that my team and I were sitting together in a meeting in person talking about the possibility of working remotely for a little bit because of this coronavirus situation. Ah, the world, that was early 2020, and boom, now we're going into our third year of living with this pandemic. I don't know about you, but for me, the last couple of years feels like a blur. (laughs) It seems that all we talk about these days is virus and vaccines and arguments about vaccines and horrible struggles with the economy and people being off sick. There's no shortage of worrisome news to talk about. Well, in a moment, I'm going to discuss the things that my team and I think are important for SEO in 2022. Things like better serving user intent, EAT, getting content indexed, core web vitals, technical SEO, link building, mum, BERT, and all those other language understanding improvements. I'm going to talk about a great article that I read on mum this week and why I think we should be paying attention to it. And also, very importantly, understanding user intent. Uh, Paying attention to these things may help give us and our clients an advantage in terms of SEO this year. But I want to share first some personal stuff. I, uh, this is completely unrelated to SEO, but bear with me because I, I think this is really cool. Um, on New Year's Eve, David and I had this really, really neat conversation about Betty White. <laughs> now, the bizarre thing is she died that morning, probably while we were talking about her. Uh, we didn't even know that when we were discussing her. <laughs> These weird coincidences keep happening to me. Well, we were marveling at her positivity. I actually think that being positive in life is like a superpower. Our our brains have this thing called valence, where we have different circuitry, depending on whether we're in a good mood or a good state or a bad. Like if we're experiencing anger or fear, our brain's in this state of negative valence. And when we experience joy or excitement, that causes us to be in a state of positive valence. And I think it's really hard, if not impossible, for us to be in both states at the same time. I also think that if we stay in negative valence for long enough, it affects our physical health, and in some cases, really seriously. So I promise you I'll get to SEO in a second, but this is just so interesting to me, and I really wanted to share it. There are loads of studies where researchers show that Um, They show people pictures of faces, and they monitor how their brains comprehend these pictures. So if they show fearful faces to these subjects, the neurons in their brain react as if they were feeling the emotion themselves, but obviously on a much smaller scale. And if they show a sad story to these subjects, all of them had the exact same changes in their brain neurons, as if they were actually feeling the tragedy themselves, but again, obviously on a much smaller scale. So when we process negative news and negative emotions and so on, I think it has an actual physical effect on our bodies. (laughs) I usually save these anecdotes for the end of the episode. So if you're just here for SEO news, skip ahead a couple of minutes. I want to tell you about a day a few weeks ago where I was in a really bad mood. (laughs) It happens. Uh, Everything that day was like super negative, worrisome, stressful, fear inducing, like welcome to the life in the 2020s, right? I I have to tell you, I was really struggling emotionally this day. So there was a Fortnite event on this day and I watched it kind of hoping it would cheer me up. (laughs) Well, there's a part in the event where the main character, his name's Jonesy, uh, he's captured and he's trapped, and he's struggling, and I was like really connecting with the character's emotions, even though this is just a silly made-up cartoon. And then this other character comes in to save him. He's called the Foundation. It's the Foundation. This guy keeps saving Jonesy over and over again. He's a hero, and to me, he represents the things that we're all subconsciously longing for, like comfort and safety and security. I probably analyzed these stories way too much. (laughs) So, The villain is shocked to see the foundation and says to him, I watched you die. And somehow that just struck me. Like the villain in was life just saying, I knocked you down. I defeated you. I saw you struggle and I give up even, but you're still here. (laughs) And and then this thing happened that literally shocked my body. The, the, and this, 
I'm questioning why I'm telling you this in an SEO podcast, but I really feel that this will help somebody. The, the foundation whips off his helmet, and we realize this whole time that it's Dwayne Johnson, the rock. <laughs> so the foundation is the rock. <laughs> like that just hits me so hard. And the rock is so darn funny. He makes me laugh so much. I'm fascinated by how this man just lives a life filled with vitality and energy and joy. Well, the villain says, I watched you die. And the foundation, the rock, he smiles and he says, I got over it. <laughs> so when I heard this and I saw it was the rock and for some reason it just struck me as super funny and ironic and I instantly burst out laughing and somehow everything lifted off of me and I was in a good mood and all the difficult stuff was not so hard to handle anymore. And I think that sudden outburst of positivity and laughter changed my brain to be in a, a it, my brain valence to be in a good state of mind. And that has very little to do with SEO. <laughs> I'm no neuroscientist, but I really felt compared to sh compelled to share that. Um, I don't do New Year's resolutions usually, but I want to tell you that my goal this year is to focus on positive stuff as much as I can. If, if looking at pictures of fearful faces can make our brains feel negativity, imagine what it's doing to our bodies when we obsess over COVID and Omicron and, and the economy and all the horrible stuff that's happening. But yet... I still think we need to be aware of what's happening. The answer is not to shut everything out or to be fake positive about all this horrible stuff that's going on in the world, but to be mindful about what we focus on and to try to find good things to dwell on and stuff to be excited about and to laugh about. I'd much rather feel excitement than dread. I don't think we can feel the two at the same time. And if we spend more time focusing on the good in our lives and not dwelling on fear and negativity, I think it can affect our, our health in a really good way. So my goal for 2022 is to focus on the good. So let's talk about what's good and exciting in SEO for 2022. I should mention that this episode of Search News You Can Use was released on January 6th, 2022, and corresponds with newsletter episode number 216, which you can find at mariehaines.com slash newsletter. We have two versions of newsletter. The free one contains the most important SEO news and announcements, and then we pack loads of tips, strategy, and uh, strategy brainstormed up by my team and I, and advice, a whole bunch of extra stuff in the paid version as well. So what should SEOs focus on in 2022? I don't claim to have all the answers, but my team and I at MHC, we've worked on quite a few websites to help improve their quality over the last 10 years. And we have lots of thoughts on what's working, what doesn't work so much anymore, and also what we should be looking at so that we can get a leg up on competitors in our search results. If we can understand what Google is trying to accomplish, then we can better advise our clients on creating quality websites that Google wants to rank. So. Let's talk first about some of the things that SEOs have been doing for years now to help their clients and look at whether these things still work. Or maybe a better way to put it is, is it worth spending time and money on these areas? Let's start with link building. We're coming up on the 10 year anniversary of Google's Penguin algorithm. Prior to Penguin, it was often incredibly easy to rank a site by making your own links pointing to it. Every month we'd find new directories to get links in or other easy places that you could just plop a link down. And you could often easily make a site rank by doing things like uh, maybe buying up a few expired domains or recreating uh, and then you recreate the sites and, and link back to your own site. <laughs> I, I remember when I first learned about how effective guest posting links were. This is like 2013 or so. To rank a local business, in many cases back then, all you'd need to do is get a few guest posts with links with exact match anchor text for the keywords that you wanted to rank for, and often it worked really, really well. But what about last year, 2021? Did link building still work? Will it help in 2022? It's actually a really hard question to answer. I think most SEOs would agree that link building in low quality directories and, you know, bookmark links and those things that we did 10 years ago, they're not going to move the needle like they did before. But we do have clients that have great success that we've attributed at least to some degree to link building, even uh, this year. 
it, it's hard to say for certain because most of her clients are working on many things to improve their rankings and their traffic, but I do think that good link acquisition is still very valuable. When I was writing my notes for this episode, I wanted to include some recent studies that have been done uh, looking at the effectiveness of link building. But what I'm finding is it's really hard to discuss these studies because just like most of SEO, there are so many variables. One person might build low quality links and decide that link building is useless. Or somebody else might be trying to build good links or build links to, sorry, good links to content uh, that maybe doesn't have the appropriate EAT to rank. Or maybe the content just isn't good or helpful. Those links aren't going to help. In, in several reports that I read, an author would claim success after link building, but then the charts that they showed for Google Analytics showed that the increases started in conjunction with a core update. So sure, it could be the links that helped, but it could also be that Google has recognized that your content is worth ranking now. Um, and maybe the links help that. It, you know, it's hard to prove that. Um, so. I reported earlier in the year on a good study that Proficient Digital did. Uh, this is the company that uh, used to be Stone Temple. Was, uh, they acquired Stone Temple. Um, and it showed that, yes, links were still important. Their conclusion, though, was that Google's algorithms were putting even more weight now on links from authoritative sites. I don't think that's any earth-shattering news, uh, but it's it, it kind of goes in line with what we've been seeing that yes, links are important, uh, but links from the right sources are what matter. My view on links is that Google's gotten much better over the years at determining which links to count as recommendations, because that's why they count links, right? If I link to you, it's me recommending your content. It, it, that recommendation uh, is a vouch for your content. In most cases, if you're building links that are easy to build, easy to scale, and you get lots of them with little effort, Google is likely just ignoring those links. But links from sites that really matter in your vertical, they still do seem to be quite helpful. I think this is for two reasons. First, sure, page rank. In 2020, John Mueller confirmed that yes, page rank was still an important part of Google's algorithms. He said in a tweet, I'm going to quote him here, yes, we do use page rank internally among many, many other signals. It's not quite the same as the original paper. There are lots of quirks, for example, disavowed links, ignored links, etc. And then he finished this tweet by saying something that I think is even more important. He said, and again, we use a lot of other signals that can be much stronger. There's a lot more to ranking than links, which brings me to the second reason why I think links are still important, and that's for entity recognition. If your site's being mentioned around the web in places that Google trusts, authoritative sites, sites that know what they're talking about and are trustworthy in Google's eyes uh, and in searchers' eyes as well, then Gary Ish told us a few years ago that Google can use these mentions for understanding entities. Now, there's a lot that we don't know about how Google uses entity information. I think that a lot of what Google uses that we call EAT, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness, is gleaned from entity information. So let's talk about EAT. What even is EAT? It's not a specific ranking factor, but rather it represents Google's attempts at determining which websites or businesses are authentic and legitimate and trustworthy enough to recommend to readers. I've spoken on EAT in probably every podcast episode that I've recorded. So if you're new to podcasts, there's a lot to learn. Uh, you can go to mariehaines.com slash eat for a massive document on everything we know on the subject. I'm not going to completely recap all of EAT in this podcast episode. A couple of years ago, I would say that working on EAT was one of the most important things that most sites could do. We had all sorts of brilliant success stories that came on the heels of making improvements like uh, adding descriptive author bios to demonstrate expertise, or cleaning up reputation issues around the web, or improving use of references and citations or other things uh, that we would do on a site to inspire trust. And we still do see improvements for many sites when we have sites make these kinds of changes. However, in competitive verticals, most of the sites that are doing well have caught on to this, and they're also likely working on improving EAT. It was five years ago now that I started offering reports where we'd look at a site's EAT and compare it to your competitors. 
five years. It was February 2017 when I first started looking at web pages that won with Google updates and seeing that they actually did have elements that were described as important in Google's quality raters guidelines, especially where they discuss EAT. Now, though, I'd view working on EAT improvements as something that's a standard foundation for any site, just like working on technical issues. It's something that's very important, and we should all be doing it, but most likely your competitors are all working on demonstrating good EAT as well now. It's not an area uh, where you're likely to get a big boost ahead, um, unless you're in a vertical where maybe the rest of your competition uh, is really not paying attention to the web so much right now. So yes, EAT is still very important. If you're new to this subject, read our blog post, read Google's blog post on what website owners should know about core updates as well. Um, all of these important uh, things I'll link to in the description uh, in this episode. My team and I spend days, sometimes weeks, coming up with ideas for improving EAT for our clients. You should definitely be focusing on EAT for 2022. Let's talk about technical SEO. For most sites we review, we start with a general crawl of the website to look for obvious technical issues. I think that we will, that will always continue to be helpful. Um, you know, the crawling and technical SEO, that's not going to go away for websites. Our goals when we're looking at technical improvements uh, to make are to find things that likely are going to make a difference, not just to find things we can work on, <laughs> but things that are likely to actually help this website that we're working on. I'm really proud of how my team's skills have grown in offering technical SEO help to our clients. Our director of technical SEO, Alec, he runs regular training for our team now, and we've come a really long way in the last few years. We used to refer out almost all of the technical work that came our way, uh, but now we're quite good at doing thorough technical reviews for sites. Uh, we had a really good discussion this week about what types of technical changes we are implementing or recommending to be implemented uh, that have made a strong positive impact for our clients. So we've seen sites have good success in doing uh, things that help Google crawl and understand your content better. So if something's blocking Google's ability to see or render a page, then of course you need to work on that. That's really important. Another thing that's moved the needle for some clients is helping Google better understand your authority and your knowledge on your subject um, and doing this by structuring your content into hubs. The idea is to have one page that's a solid hub of knowledge and then several supporting pages on the topic that link back to that page. And what you're doing is you're showing Google that you are experts in this topic, you have a really thorough uh, understanding of it, and then you have other uh, thoughts that support that understanding. And we've found that that's really helped a lot of uh, websites that we've worked with. A tactic we used to do a lot of, but I'm not so sure about now, is fixing broken links. I mean, we still do it, but it feels like it's less effective than it used to be. We've had sites where we found hundreds, even thousands of high quality links that pointed to pages that no longer exist. And we painstakingly mapped out redirects to appropriate pages, expecting to see beautiful improvements that did not end up happening. For one site, we found links on the New York Times, on Forbes, uh, many other sites, like really good natural mentions, not SEO made, uh, actual uh, journalists reaching out to um, uh, to want to link out to this site, and they were pointing to 404 pages. So that means that those links pass no page rank to the site. If they point to a 404 or a 410 page, they're not going to pass any page rank. We took each of those pages that had good links pointing to them and we redirected them to similar pages on the site and it had literally zero effect. Again though, there's so many variables. I don't think that my conclusion is that redirecting broken links is dead or useless. We still do it when, it ha when we think it has the potential to help. There's no harm in doing it other than the time spent. Um, and if you've had good success with uh, broken link, uh, rep repairing broken links, I'd love for you to share uh, some of your data with me. Um, I don't want to base my uh, decision here just on a couple of our cases. Um, I think probably there are some cases where fixing broken links still can make a difference. Uh, but maybe not as dramatic as, uh, as you think. A technical improvement that we feel is important to work on is internal linking. 
This week I retweeted a couple of people who had really good ideas here. We've always done, uh, at MHC, we've always done manual work here with site colon searches. Uh, so for example, if I wrote an article on disavowing links, I do a search for site colon mariehaines.com disavow. And that would find other pages on my site that Google thinks are relevant to that keyword. And then I'd find ways on those pages to insert an internal link uh, within the main body of content, not just from you know your navigation or your footer, uh, but from within the main body of content to my new article that I've written. This is a good idea, but it takes a lot of time. Well, Mike Ginley published an article this week where he shared a really good process. He uses Ahrefs or SEMrush to find keywords where he's ranking in position five to 15 for. You could really, you could do this in Search Console too. It might just take a bit more time. And then he uses Screaming Frog's custom search to find pages on his site that contain those keywords. I really like that idea. And yeah, I, I do think that improving internal linking is something that's worthwhile to work on. We've seen many examples of sites that have seen improvements uh, because of improved internal linking. A couple of other people uh, chimed into that thread too about um, uh, about using Screaming Frog and, and whatnot to find internal links with Python scripts that did the same. Uh, so uh, there's lots of opportunity out there. Next, what about core web vitals? Google made a really big deal trying to get us to work on improving things like how quickly our pages load, whether they jump around on the user, things like that. <laughs> I accidentally tapped on an ad today because of a stupid layout shift. <laughs> I don't think that me yelling, fix your CLS issues at the website made much of a difference. Uh, Google does not want to display sites that frustrate users. Still though, I, I mean, we've seen that so far, improving core web vitals seems to have minimal impact for most sites. My thoughts here are that you should improve your core web vitals if you have any scores that are in the red. But working like crazy to move scores from yellow to green is probably not the best use of our time. Unless you can do things that uh, make your pages dramatically better for users. Google renamed the core web vitals update to call it the page experience update, adding a few other goodies to evaluate like mobile friendliness, whether the page has intrusive interstitials, things like that, all worth looking at. But I can't recall a case right now where we felt we made a huge difference by improving on core web vitals alone. Another thing that's always good to look at is indexation. <laughs> I can see Barry Adams' eyes rolling from here. <laughs> Barry prefers that we call it indexing. I don't care what you call it, but a lot of websites have had more issues than usual with getting content indexed this year. Uh, at least it seemed that way to me. I, I mentioned last week that maybe it's not as big of an issue and maybe it, it, it just seems big to me because uh, I'm looking into it more. Uh, but I really do feel like uh, Google has made it harder to get new, contact, new content indexed. It's worth taking a look at your index coverage report in Search Console if you haven't done so in a while. If you're seeing pages in there that Google has decided not to index, but they really should be in the index, you could be dealing with quality issues on your site. Or again, it's worthwhile looking at whether there are technical issues hindering Google from crawling those pages. Um, again, I've, I've spoken of indexing issues in the last few podcast episodes. I don't think I have too much new to report here. All right, none of the stuff that I've mentioned so far really is new for 2022. Here's what I think is going to change or is already changing. The, the first thing is really, it's really hard to measure and it's very hard to make widespread changes on your site in this area. I think something that is incredibly important right now is to look at how well you are serving user intent. Like if a searcher lands on your page, is it super obvious to them that they've landed in the right place and their answer is on this page? In late 2019, when Google told us about BERT, they said it was incredibly good at understanding the intent behind a user's query. So when my team and I do competitor page comparisons, what we do first is ask ourselves, what do most searchers who land on this page, what are they trying to accomplish? And is it easy to find their answer on this page? There's tools that help us to some extent to understand user intent, but I'm not sure how useful they are. <laughs> I mean, SEMrush tells us now whether keywords have transactional or informational intent, and this is helpful to some extent. But now, I might be giving Google too much credit here, but I don't think I am. 
I think there are millions of different kinds of intent. I think Google's goal is to say, ah, this person typed in this query. What they really want to know is this. I'm, I'm not sure that a tool will be able to determine that type of thing. So how can we improve our pages to better meet user intent? One thing you can do is look at Search Console data and see what keywords you're ranking for. Uh, low down on page one or maybe into page two. And then ask yourself whether a searcher who typed that query in would actually be happy with your page. Let, let's say the query was how to tie a tie. In the past, optimizing a page to rank for this query would be all about keywords. We would try to include as much as we can about ties and tying ties on this page a history of ties, and maybe a paragraph about the types of materials they're made with. Our goal would be to show search engines that we have loads of information on this topic. But is that what's best for users? If you searched for how to tie a tie, you're likely standing in front of a mirror frustrated and you don't want to read about the history of ties. The first site that I see ranking organically for how to tie a tie is ties.com. Now, the exact match domain is likely helping them here, and I haven't looked at EAT and how authoritative they are. Those, those things all likely help too. But what I wanted to point out is what a good job they do at helping the user find the answer to their question as quickly as possible. The page starts with headings and images to show me the three most common types of ties, and when you click on one of those, you get a video that shows you step-by-step -step what to do. That's perfect. Now, let's say you have an article on ties that uses the method I described earlier that covers everything possible on ties. Starts with the heading that says, what, what are ties? And has 500,000, or maybe not 500,000. I remember something came out years ago that was like, uh, it was a ranking factor to have 5,000 plus words. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people just added stuff to their content just so they could produce lots and lots of content, many words. I'm telling you, no matter how many links you build to that content, or no matter how much you improve the page load time, or add schema, or do other SEO improvements, it's not going to change the fact that users can find their answer more quickly on ties.com. But does that mean that every site should use the same format that they do? Well, no. I mean, for some queries, I likely do want to read paragraphs of content. For others, a video might not be helpful. I really think that one of the most important things we can do right now is make our content more helpful than the other choices Google has to rank. Provided you have the EAT to compete in this space, this is one of the best things that we can be doing right now, in my opinion. I've spoken in past podcast episodes on other things we can do to help users find their answer more quickly. I, I really think we should be paying attention to things that help searchers skim, like good use of headings, bolded words, tables of contents, and, and so on. All right, we're almost through. The next thing I want to talk about, I touched on it a bit earlier, is Google's use of entities and also the semantic web. I, I think there's a lot going on behind the scenes here that if we can understand more about how Google uses entities, we can create better content that Google wants to rank. At this year's Search On event, they spoke about how Google can use MUM, Multitask Unified Model, to not only better understand language, but also to write language. Because MUM is multimodal, it's able to analyze and understand information from different formats, like uh, not just web pages, but pictures, uh, images, videos, and so on. And it can do this all at the same time. I read a really good article from Andre Prakarovich on MUM this week. He says that if MUM works as Google intends, it will dramatically change the appearance of the search results. It's meant to analyze and generate content like a human would. It's MUM that powers the new SERP feature that's called Things to Know. Now, I haven't seen Things to Know in action yet. I I'm not sure if perhaps it's just live in the US as I'm in Canada, or maybe it's not live yet. Uh, I haven't seen people talking about it much. Um, it's very similar to People Also Ask boxes, but much, much more detailed. In the announcement about MUM, Google showed us a, a Things to Know SERP feature where the search was painting with acrylics and MUM pulled out topics uh, to, to like how to start acrylic painting or what are the styles of acrylic painting. It figured out what is important to searchers who are doing this search. 
it was mom that figured out those things. And, and as they, uh, and then they described how users will be able to broaden or refine their searches with suggestions like uh, that Google will make, like acrylic painting sets or acrylic painting online courses. And Google is able to figure out what is it that is important to users who have these questions. So how can we optimize for mum, <laughs> for things to know? I, I have a feeling that the answer lies in better understanding Google's use of entities, and again, in better understanding user intent. And much of this stems from having the real life expertise to know what types of questions do your searchers actually have. I also think the SERPs are gonna be changing a lot because of mum. And, and we'll need to pay more attention to what videos, images, and other SERP features are ranking. I'm predicting that this year, we're going to see a lot of changes in what search results look like, even further from the 10 blue organic links that we had years ago. Uh, I do hope to put some more time into learning more about Google's use of entities this year. I spent some time talking with Jason Barnard recently, and I, I have a lot that I want to learn on here, uh, and I'll be talking more in future podcast episodes. And also, you know, the semantic web. Although, I'm going to be honest with you here and say that I'm out of my depth and not knowledgeable on these subjects. I'm going to share with you as I learn. I, I've been hearing a lot about the semantic web, Web3, Web3 Web3.0, and, and I'll admit my knowledge is really lacking here. I found a really good post on the website for Brave Search. Brave is a competitor to Google. Uh, and, and the way they described it uh, was that Web 1.0 represented a web that was read-only for the most part. And Web 2.0 was the dawn of social media and apps and, and CMS um, solutions that uh, allowed regular users to interact easily with the internet. Most sites that we know today are Web 2.0. Well, Web3 is about the blockchain and decentralized networks. The Brave article says, quote, it does not require blind faith in the benevolence of some central authority to manage your data safely. A, a few of my team members know a lot more than I do on this subject, and, and I'm sure that some of you listening are way, way more knowledgeable on this too. I, I honestly don't think that as SEOs right now, we need to be paying close attention to Web3. I could be wrong on that. It, it's not a conversation that's come up with our clients as of yet, as far as I know, but the day may be coming, and, and this is an area where I'm tuned in and listening, as is my team. Okay, so let's sum all this up. I think the most important things we can work on for 2022 are having a good foundation in terms of technical SEO and EAT, internal linking, content structure, like having good content hubs, Mention building, as opposed to link building, which by the way, you can reach out to us uh, if you want to be connected with somebody who does good work in that area. Um, and then also understanding and meeting user intent as best we can. This is probably a good place to end this episode. I'm sure that I have not covered everything that's important to SEOs uh, to work on for 2022. I would love to hear your thoughts on what you're prioritizing this year. You can reach out to me on Twitter at Marie underscore Haynes, or you can contact my team and I at help at MarieHaynes.com if you have thoughts to share or if you're interested in hiring us to do some work with your website. All right, I'm off to finish up online school with my girls and then play some Fortnite, clear my mind of SEO, and think positive thoughts <laughs> as I destroy kids in the game. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I hope wherever you are, you're staying safe and that you're able to find some joy and excitement in your days. I'm incredibly excited about learning more about what Google values in 2022. Thanks for listening, and I wish you the best of luck with your rankings.